Ladies and gentlemen, if, if I could have your attention, please, we are going to begin the 2011 34th Annual Northwood University Freedom Seminar. I'm Tim Nash, and I'm the Vice President of Strategic and Corporate Alliances for the University, and honored to hold the uh, David E. Fry Professorship in Free Market Economics here at the University. And we'll be working with Dr. Matchek and Dr. Ebling uh, with you for the 2011 Freedom Seminar. As you know, the Freedom Seminar is something that we celebrate annually because we know that it is the freedom that individuals have been able to celebrate in many places, but especially uniquely here in the United States that has created this American competitive free enterprise system, the highest standard of living in the history of the world, and many of the world's great inventions and innovations. So over the next uh, three and a half days, you are going to hear a number of nationally and internationally noted speakers, and you are going to spend a tremendous amount of time studying and challenging these ideas that, uh, that cause a, a free society to prosper. Debate these ideas. Make certain that um, you feel comfortable with the topics and, and with the ideas that um, are presented because they will make a tremendous difference in your future, not only in the future of your state, your country, but I dare say the world. And so it is with that in mind that I ask you to have a lot of fun, but also make certain that you understand you're here to learn and you're here to be a greater intellectual asset, a greater human capital asset when you leave the seminar than you are today at the beginning of the seminar. It is my honor to introduce the president of Northwood University, Dr. Keith A. Pretty, who will introduce this year's keynote speaker. Dr. Pretty. Good evening. It's nice to see many of you again. Some of you I just saw a few days ago at commencement. Uh, it's nice to see some of you uh, back finishing requirements. And for some of the rest of you, uh, uh, as Dr. Nash has said, you're going to have a great experience in the, over the course of the next three days. This is a seminar that we've been putting on for over 30 years. I think you said this is our 34th year to offer the Freedom Seminar. How many years have we been doing it here in Detroit, Tim? Seventh consecutive year here in Detroit. And uh, it is a, it's a great opportunity for you to learn and and enjoy the ambiance of the city um, with some extraordinary resources over the course of the next three days. And it's my privilege tonight to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michael Cox. Dr. Cox is the director of the Center for Global Markets and Freedom, very appropriate job for the lead-off speaker at the Freedom Seminar. He's also, uh, and that's at the Cox School of Business at Southern Methodist University. I mean, how good does it get when when you, Michael Cox, are teaching at the Cox School of Business. Uh, uh, I presume it's a family-owned enterprise, right? Is that what we're going to hear tonight? Dr. Cox comes to us uh, from Dallas, from Southern Methodist University in the Cox School of Business. And he was formerly the chief economist for and senior vice president for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, where he served for 25 years advising the president on monetary and other economic policies. He has the unique distinction of having been the only individual in our Federal Reserve System to hold the, the title of chief economist in, in history. He's widely published in academic journals uh, across this country. He's published in Fed publications. He is numerous, has numerous articles and op-ed pieces to his credit in virtually every major daily publication across this country, publications like the Wall Street Journal that you read and the New York Times and, and uh, USA Today, the Financial Times, uh, you name it, he has been uh, quoted or written pieces for those publications. He's also a regular on the electronic media. In fact, we have one guest here this evening that is here because he heard him on Detroit radio this morning and was impressed and wanted to come and, and join and, and hear more about what Dr. Cox has to say. He has the innate ability, which you all are going to appreciate, I think, very much, to take complex economic issues and break them down into very plain, 
spoken ways so that we can all uh, understand and debate the issues that, that uh, we're here to learn about. So I hope you all will join me in welcoming to the podium our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael Cox. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I, I was really well done. I, I, I hear myself get introduced a lot, but you're so good and so relaxed. You take the same material and make it sound better than anybody ever heard. So thank you for that. Um, let me check first here. Dale, how are we doing? Am I, am I, are you, uh, can I walk or do I need to stay in this one spot? Okay. All right, I'm going to walk over here some. Thank you for inviting me back. Tim and I have been working together for a long time, good friends. I can remember our first trip up here, and I've uh, had many occasions to work with the Northwood people, and it's an honor once again to do that this year. And um, I have a different talk for you. We were going to discuss the issue of China and India and so on. I can talk about that. I can talk about many things, but I thought since I'm coming here to Detroit, I would give a presentation that Tim and I talked about on the phone a few months back when I was going to give a presentation in, on this subject in, uh, in Dallas, I called up Tim first and we talked about it because I knew he would, had, would have thought about this from this area and he had some good ideas and so I worked on those things. And so today I want to talk about this subject of what happened to America's automobile industry. That's a Packard plant I just uh, showed you there. And um, But we, when we think about the beginning of the industry in America, we think about the Ford Model T. It really began before that. It began, if you want to read about the beginning of the U.S. automobile industry, you should go back and read a book called Horseless Carriage Days by Hyam Percy Maxim. And that's interesting because uh, Hyam Percy Maxim was the son of an in, somebody who invented it. It wasn't dynamite, and it wasn't a nitro, it might have been nitroglycerin, it, whatever Whatever the, the uh, Nobel didn't invent was another explosive, and his he was fa family was wealthy, and um, so he, he owned a little shop, a little where he tinkered around with things, and uh, was riding his bicycle back one night under the moonlight from a long trip out to see his girlfriend, a 30-mile bicycle trip to see his girlfriend. On the way back, on one of his many trips pedaling along, said, you know, he's just sitting there pedaling, 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 and and. Um, started thinking about his shop back at home where he had a little two-cycle engine. Why didn't he m mount that engine on the side of his bicycle and just have it turn the wheel for him? When he got back to his shop, he started working on that. And, of course, little did he know, many inventors like that all over the country were thinking the same thing, even the Wright brothers in their bicycle shop. Uh, but then, uh, So that's where the automobile was born, from the horse's carriage days. And without the uh, bicycle, uh, we probably would not have launched his, his headlong into the, uh, the automobile because... The bicycle created a love for Americans with personal transportation. Horses were a pain. About bicycles, we just go jump on it and you're gone. So that's a great book to read about the beginning of the automobile industry, which really took place more around 1890 than 1912. But here's the Ford Model T with which most people associate the beginning of the automobile industry. Later on, we got the production lines going on this DeSoto 1929 automobile. You see this plant? You guys should just turn around, really because you're going to miss a lot of good stuff here. Now, I'm, so I'm kind of celebrating the beginning of the automobile industry. Here's a 1935 Packard sedan. You see what that looked like. Things get a little bit more streamlined here with this 1941 Pontiac Streamliner. Now, uh, as, after the uh, Second World War, cars still kind of had a throwback to the formal black models of the past, but began to kind of loosen up a little bit. We won the war. Um, there was some color brought into the automobiles. You know, Ford, back when he invented the Model T, said the customer can have any model, any color car he wants, so long as it's black. But we're starting to get color into the automobiles here and some flair of the 49 Mercury Wagon, the Dodge Coronet, still a good-looking car, Nash Rambler, the first car I owned was a Nash Rambler. I wrecked it, and my dad got me another Nash Rambler. So I learned wrecking the car you don't like doesn't get you very far. A 1949 student, uh, Studebaker Starlight's a cute car. Then the Ford Fairlane Car of the Year, 1956, the, the infamous T-Bird, uh, my favorite car ever, probably the 56 Corvette, and the 1958 Edsel, which was way ahead of its time. Moving on out, you see one of the first SUVs, the Jeep Wagoneer, the classic Ford 65 Mustang, 
the Chevy Impala, kind of a family car. And then um, a car by Rich and Anson Uncles used to enjoy driving, the Lincoln Continental. Biggest station wagon ever made with the most inside room, uh, Buick 72 station wagon where the kids could jump in the back and family could drive out to the Grand Canyon, um, have numerous fights along the way, I'm sure, as we did in our car. But that's, uh, that's kind of the glory days of the American automobile industry. And what began as this, you know, you see here in this production plants in early America here in Detroit, and what flourished for many years has come now to this. Things are in ruins. This is the GM plant. Pretty much, you know, just a parking lot now. Folks coming up there every day to make sure there's nobody in the building, and but no, nothing going on production-wise, and the industry in great decline. So why? Why did this happen? Well, I'm going to tell you, some of this was inevitable. In fact, some of it was even good. Because capitalism grows through a process, capitalism progresses, and nations grow through a process of creative destruction. Out with the old, in with the new. It happens in every product. That's the churn, and that's capitalism's churn at work. How many automobile manufacturers do you think there have been in America that are now defunct? 1,896 automobile companies have come and gone in America. If you go over to Wikipedia and you ask for a list of them, you'll see some pretty quirky names we've had for automobiles. There's a lot of them. In 1962 alone, for that, I mean 1920, <coughs> there were 262 automobile companies. And all those are dead, except for the ones at the bottom, five or six right there. Ford, Buick, Chevy. Now, Chevy and Cat Cadillac. Now, these were the ones that were alive back then. Of course, we've introduced other ones, but these were the ones that were alive in 1920 and have managed to make it to today. The automobile industry, of course, has not shrunk. It's grown tremendously. In 1970, there were only 54 cars for every 100 people in America. Today, there are 96. So the industry is flourishing across the globe. <coughs> Excuse me. Consolidated a lot. We've consolidated a lot into American companies, and then of course all those foreign companies. One of those. Now let me back up. Um, so I remember having, you know, growing up, that I remember seeing cars like the Dodge, the Oldsmobile, the Studebaker, and even the Packard. And we, I think, we even had a Hudson. Those are gone from the scene now. A Packard. This is a Packard plant <clears throat> that was closed. When we closed them up American Motors, it, though when, when an automobile manufacturer dies, what they do, what they have invented and all the good things that about them don't die, they just get incorporated into the surviving companies. Microeconomic failure is not macroeconomic failure. When an individual company dies, that's not the death of an industry. In fact, that's the way the economy progresses. They're turning the businesses over to those who have a better idea, can do it more efficiently, more cheaply. When cars first started coming out, before there was any major auto companies, they were made in craft shops. You would go to a bicycle manufacturer, or you'd go to a carriage manufacturer, and you would ask them to make you a car. And they would make you your, your own individual car, bending all the sheet metal, like you see on those motorcycles today. And cars it would average about two to three hundred thousand dollars in today's dollars. Ford standardized the process, brought the, brought the price down by standardized nuts and bolts. That was an innovation, and all those innovations we've had throughout the years have remained in our cars, including the air conditioner, adjustable seats, the aluminum engine, automatic transmission, seat belts, granulated windshields so you don't get cut if you get, hit the windshield. All those things were brought to you by American Motors, and though, though it's dead, those inventions aren't, and they remained in the surviving companies who had a better idea and could deliver you a better product. So microeconomic failure is not macroeconomic failure. When you see a business failing, that's not the industry failing. That's the way the industry transfers resources from those who can't do it well to those who can. Now here's America's most valuable companies back to 1917 and going forward to 2011. What you'll see, part of the churn and the creative destruction is that 
a, an industry like the, mo the automobile industry, here's General Motors, will rise at one time, be it on the top of the heap. Second most valuable company in America in 1945 was General Motors. Then it slipped to fourth by 1967, to um, fifth by 1987, and here comes Ford, seventh by then. But they're both gone, I'm sorry, but they're both gone off of the uh, scene today. They're nowhere near the top, of course. Basically bankrupt just a couple just a year ago, so gone way down in terms of their market capitalization. Uh, that's the churn. This um, is the churn in action too. Notice here that the in kind of that uh, medium color blue, that's U.S. auto production in terms of thousands of vehicles, and you can see it back to 1961. And you can see that we have a lot of foreign manufacturers of cars coming into the automobile scene over this decade. China made almost no cars in 2001. Now China is the world's leading manufacturer of cars. Germany is second, I mean Japan is second, taking second place to China now, then Germany, and then South Korea, then Brazil, then the United States is sixth, and it's almost now surpassed by India, which have moved the United States to the seventh largest producer. So that's, that's foreign competition. I don't mind that. Churn is fine, creative destruction is fine, foreign competition is fine, but if you look more closely at what's going on, especially over the past eight years, we have this very rapid decline. At one time in 1961, Amer I'm doing market share now, America had almost 50% of, of global auto production. Global. We produced half the world's cars in 61. Today it's down to 4.3% and much of the decline that you see is has come very rapidly and sharply in just the past eight years. That is just, there's clearly something wrong. Chrysler, Ford, and GM now shrinking in terms of even U.S. motor vehicle sales here in America. So these are, where do the cars that we sell in America come from? Declining from GM, Ford, and Chrysler, rising from Toyota, Honda, Nissan, Hyundai, Volkswagen almost disappeared, but now it's making a little comeback. In the other group, the two biggest sellers are BMW and Mercedes, which is a Daimler product. So those are the biggest ones over there. Um, and that's kind of interesting, too. There's so many cars available now. Uh, so they're declining. Our own cars here, made in this country, are declining as a fraction of sales in this country. Auto employment, which uh, rose from under 500,000 in 1940 up to nearly one point. 4 million in the late 70s has now dropped sharply, declined to under 700,000. You can see that really sharp decline uh, in the recession and only a brief, mi only a mild comeback to this point. So that's happening very fast. GM closes 1,100 dealerships. Chrysler sheds 10,000 jobs, and I can show you a lot more of those kind of newspaper articles. They all say the same thing. The stock price, GM stock price goes from 95 down to, I think it got down to two at one point. Um, and uh, not just there, but in factories in, in general in America, we've lost three million jobs just since the year 2000. Well, okay, well this didn't have to happen. That's too far, too much. That's more than churn. That's more than creative destruction. Something is clearly wrong. What is it? Well, five things. There are five forces destroying Detroit. And I want to go over there with those today. Not necessarily in this order, but here they are. Taxes in this country, corporate taxes. Unions, regulation, protectionism, and liability law. Each one of these things has, in and of itself, done a, a tremendous amount of damage, but taken together, there's no way this industry can survive, nor can any industry in America which uh, continues to go to be punished by these five forces. Let's begin with corporate taxes. Um, here is the corporate tax rate in America and other countries, our OECD nations and some of our peer nations, in 1996. The darkish blue there is average. Average corporate tax rate of, looks about 37.5%. About at that time, the corporate tax rate in America was 40%. So we weren't that different from average across the globe in terms of our corporate tax rate. We were above average. You can see us there. 
but we weren't far above average. Other nations like Japan and so on had substantially higher tax rates than us. But other nations over the past 11 years, I'm sorry, past 15 years have cut their tax rate. Um, in fact, uh, every nation has cut their tax rate far more than America has. Recently, just a couple months ago, Japan cut their corporate tax rate, now leaving us, if you reorder things here, as number one. I'm going to rejuggle them. Now we're number one with the highest corporate tax rate in the country, in the world, I mean. We have cut our corporate tax rate only three-fourths of 1% over the same time period, 14 years, that the rest of the nations on the globe have cut theirs 11.4%. And, you know, Obama every once in a while makes a, a, a head fake toward maybe cutting the taxes, but I've, so far it's just been a, only that, a head fake, not actual action. Everything there is tested for its political value, but then done on the basis of its real merit. Anyway, so... This is the corporate tax rate. We're now the worst in the world. What does this do? Why should you make cars in America for export to the rest of the world? You make them here, you're going to have to pay a high corporate tax rate, so just make them abroad and sell them abroad and leave the money over there in Germany. U.S. now, GM now exports more cars from Germany than does BMW. So we make our cars over there. Don't employ, US, don't hire U.S. labor. Don't have the company be here. Don't just... Don't repatriate the profits. And you can see here that uh, we, America's creating many, many jobs. This is not a jobless recovery. It's just a jobless recovery in the United States. We're creating lots of jobs abroad. And it's, it is in the auto industry and other industries, but it is definitely in the auto industry for one. For one. So this is part of what's going on, a big part, the corporate tax rate. What about regulation? How many parts on a car do you think are regulated? Well, you're going to see. But we started regulating cars back in the, well, forever, but really got bad in the 70s, 60s and 70s. We had a couple of cars that um, consumer activists deemed not roadworthy and uh, unsafe at any speed. One of them was the Corvair. Another one was the Pinto. People got killed in cars. Well, that happens all the time, of course. But uh, Ralph Nader wrote this book. <coughs> Unsafe at Any Speed, published in 1965 and was kind of a self-appointed uh, custodian of consumer uh, rights and got a lot, got really, made himself really popular doing that and couldn't stop. And Anyway, he jumped on the Corvair saying it was unsafe at any speed. In response to that, you should go watch this video on YouTube about the 1960 Corvair. The tests and stuff that Chevy put this car through before and after the claims against it. They couldn't, they tried, they tried to make it be unsafe and they couldn't make it be unsafe on the road. They took it up a creek uh, through a crash course every, and finally rolled it over. And when they rolled it over, the passenger still wasn't hurt. Yet Ralph Nader, Ralph Nader uh, was successful in uh, creating a lot of hostility against this car um, and attacking the auto industry. Uh, and in, in beginning a lot of kinds of regulations. He really was instrumental in starting a lot of safety regulations. And so we had seat belts. I'm fine with that. And, but it just keeps going. New standards, shoulder belts, head restraints, energy absorbing steering columns, everything. Airbags mandated by government and actually killed a lot of people the first years they came out because they, the auto industry had to put them in cars, but they weren't ready yet, and children got killed by them. Anyway, other kinds of regulations, emissions regulations, later mileage regulations, the CAFE standards, and then other regulations. Bumpers have to meet the five mile an hour standards, steering wheels have to collapse, um, and so on. Even the paint, everything on the car is regulated. Uh, if you look at this quick reference guide, quick reference guide to federal motor vehicle safety standards, this is, and you look at the table of contents, for quick reference, you can go through parts, you know, five, seven, one point, through blah, blah, blah. And what is it? You can just look at all these different things that are regulated. It's astounding how government is basically making this car. I'll be happy to send you this presentation. And you can show it to people, and you can click on these websites and see what you get, how much is there. But 
It's just an enormous number of regulations regarding virtually every part on the car from the, the kind of material that's inside the car. Here's just a sample of the regulated auto parts. So uh, what this means, you know, here's a picture of the stuff that's regulated on the cars, and now we've got regulations for the, for the mileage requirements, how you know, far a car has to, drive, to travel on a gallon of gasoline, which raised the price of a car by about $1,300. What's the problem with regulation? The problem is regulation occupies the engineer's mind. And then when the engineer's mind needs to be on innovation if you're going to be competitive in the global car market. We had 1,896 automobile companies in America, and you should have seen some of the cars. There were you know, stuff that would never pass safety restrictions today, like this 1918 Briggs and Stratton Flyer cycle car. Oh, her dress might get caught on the chain, and then she would get hurt. Okay, so... The car industry, said, so the customer complains, and the car industry says, let's don't make it that way because we don't want to hurt the, hurt the customer. They're not going to buy our product. We don't need government to tell us what to do and what not to do when we have the customer telling us whether they like it or not through the, through the declining sales of our, of our product. But the government is all over this. And when you do that, it refocuses the <coughs> engineer's attention away from innovation. Right. My foot is on the brake. I'm now going to push this little button on the steering wheel here, and it will set off at some um, race speed. Here we go. Now, now you see that's uncanny. It's revving up to 7,000 RPM, changing gear. It's turned right. It's coming to the first corner. Brake, please. Brake, brake, brake! Brake, brake! It is. I Bottom can't left, you can see his foot's on the brakes. I did so good. Coming up to the tires, 100 kilometers an hour. That's 62 as we brake to turn into Chicago. As we steam towards the hammerhead now. 100 miles an hour. And it's going to go hard on the brakes. It has. There it is. I'm not doing that. My foot is still nowhere near the pedals. It's turning in. Can you imagine if the British had built this. Ah, well, we didn't get it quite right. Yeah. That's what happened there. We just... This, that didn't be there. Yeah. Is it going to lift for the follow-through? We're now up to 130 kph. 140. Apparently, you can even put this on an M3 if you really want to frighten yourself. To death! Coming up to the tyres. Here we go. 120... 30. This is 95 miles an hour through the tyres. Bang on! Please don't get it wrong. Please don't get it wrong. Please don't get it wrong. And it's just changed up to fourth. Break, 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 break. Second to last corner. Come on, break. Good, 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 good. The oh, stick. You are sacked. You are so sacked. It's unbelievable. Now, now, how do I stop it? Um. I forgot to ask the man how I stop it. It's, um... I'm going to be out here for the rest of my life! How much petrol's it got in it? Three quarters of a tank. That's a BMW 330i, and that's Germany. It's not the United States. Tim, remember this conversation? Yes. I told Tim, you know, but we have this modern technology and stuff, and he said, you mean you say it or you want to say it? Tim said, yeah, I drove in a car like that in Detroit. Was it GM product? 20 years ago? They put me in the back seat of a car, took me for a test drive with all this equipment and stuff, and, you know, it was a driverless car. And uh, we, we had this technology 20 years ago. Why don't we have it in our cars today? Regulation. Think about this. America has been in the automobile business just about longer than anybody with, with big, deep industry. By all rights, what should we be doing in the automobile industry today? Backing out? Making cheap cars? No. Our road system should be the most developed in the world. At least our, automo our, our freeways, our 46,000 miles of freeways, 
interstate highways should have all this, con all this equipment in them so that this car can go down there like it's the Autobahn. It's a lot safer than texting drivers, I'll tell you that. And so we, get the, we, we should be at the forefront of innovation in the automobile industry, showing the rest of the world how to do it. Instead, we're, you know, we're just picking up the pieces. That's where we should be, and we're not there because regulation has replaced in, in, innovation in the engineer's mind, but not in Germany. This technology is not new. It's been around for over two decades. Stymied by regulation is engineer's attention moves from innovating for the customer to satisfying government demands, that is, from growing your, our market share in the global arena to avoiding fines. What, how pathetic is that? Protectionism. What is that? It's using laws and anything else you can to protect yourself from competition. The very thing that makes us stronger, competition. This is the 1966 Toyota Corolla. I was born in 1950. I remember one of my girlfriends had one of these. And I remember looking at her little car. Her parents bought her this car. And uh, it was one of the first Japanese automobiles. This was one of the... It was the Toyota Corolla and the Corona who came in the mid-60s. All we used to see rolling around on the street was some Volkswagens and some little Fiats. Um, so we had this, uh, you know, in the 60s we got the, we, like I said, we already had the Volkswagen Beetle, which was one of the, one of the few small cars which was energy efficient, gas efficient. And then because gasoline prices were getting high, we imported, the customer wanted cheaper, smaller cars which are more fuel efficient. So we bought to these, these Datsuns and these Toyotas and the Honda Civics in the 70s. Detroit didn't like it. They wanted to sell you the car they, that they had been working on for years and that they wanted you to have. So what was Detroit's response to this? Voluntary export restraints on the Japanese automobile industry. At first, uh, they tried... They tried to put tariffs and, and um, quotas on Japanese cars, and then they realized, well, this is going to make us look bad. Um, so, and, and the Congress didn't want to do that. For the Congress didn't want to force these cars out of the American consumers' hands. And so, after a bunch of harassing and haranguing, where we wound up was Congress uh, told Japan, at of course the arm twisting of the, the uh, lobbyists from the automobile industry, U.S. automobile industry, told them, well, you've got to voluntary, voluntarily limit your exports of cars to America. <coughs> voluntary, sure. Well, if they violated, of course, they, Congress would have made it involuntary and would have forced it upon them. So they did abide, the Japanese did abide by these voluntary export restraints, but their reaction wasn't just to say, oh, darn, we can't export as many cars to America anymore. What did they do? They moved their automobile plants to America so they could build it here and then it wouldn't be an import anymore. And they said, well, as long as we're going to sell you a car, we're not going to sell you a cheap one, we're going to take over the luxury car market. And what you see in terms of cars made in America is that domestic-made domestic vehicles began on the decline after this period of beginning of protectionism. Domestic-made foreign cars and on the rise and so they begin to supplant us as automobile manufacturers and begin to make luxury cars. In 1981, the average price of a domestic automobile was slightly higher, $16, than the average price of an import. So they're roughly equal in terms of their quality as long as we can say price and quality go hand in hand. But just two decades later, the average price of an import is 50% higher than the domestic car, and of course you know what I'm talking about, the, the, the Lexus, the BMW, the Mercedes, the, uh, what's, the, what's the Nissan version of that, the Infiniti, and so on. So they've taken over the luxury market in Detroit's wrestling to try to get some of it back, and you know, so that's a very smart response to it. And, but to a treat foreign cars as if they're an invasion, uh, is not going to work. Customers like them. New York Times, of course, is going to portray it that way. And to have all these anti-dumping claims against foreigners who make parts for our cars to try to protect the U.S. auto parts industry, again, is just going to equal the death of the industry eventually. Anything that's protected eventually gets weaker. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's children whose parents 
you know, cover for them all the time and make, roll up the red carpet for them. And every time they get in trouble, go get them out of jail or out of, go get them, you know, break, get their, talk to their teacher and raise, get the teacher to raise the grades or whatever. Anything that's protected gets weaker. You protect the automobile industry, it gets weaker. And uh, that certainly has happened. We have all these anti-dumping claims. We have a new way that people can try to keep out the foreign competition by going to the courts and saying, oh, you're dumping steel on us. You're dumping ball bearings on us, windshields, brake rotors, auto bodies, and paint. You're selling below cost. <coughs> below cost. And they're claiming this is ruinous competition. But do you know whose cost they get to use to evaluate whether it's below cost? If it's below American cost, not their cost of production in the foreign country. They don't use, they're not, these companies, these foreign companies aren't selling their parts below how much it costs for them to make it. They're selling their, their uh, parts for how much it costs for our companies to make it. They're not losing money to sell these parts, but the courts deem them as uh, engaging in predatory competition. And so then they find them and they transfer some of the money from this foreign country company to the U.S. company who sues them. They award them damages in courts. And of course, they pursue it, therefore, that way. And the courts are a good way to get a lot of money that, uh, and protect yourself that way. They have been. They're very insidious. This is one of the most insidious forms of protectionism, uh, anti-dumping claims that we have. And it's been widely used uh, in the automobile industry to protect us against such things as steel. Well, the problem is, if you protect the steel industry in the United States, you drive up the price of steel, which goes into our cars, and you make us less competitive in the automobile industry by driving up the price of the car. How do you make a car in this very competitive global environment? You make it any which way you can, using any part from anywhere, the best part at the cheapest price that you can get, without any kind of restrictions. If you put restrictions on it, then you're going to suck on domestic contract restrictions. Oh, well, 60% you know, of your car has to come from America. When you add up the value of all the parts, we have domestic content restrictions. That's a form of restrictions. That is going to raise the price of the car. Because, how, because car markets are very competitive worldwide. There are 768 million motor vehicles on the planet made by 198 different automobile companies with 741 assembly plants in 59 countries. If you want to really see some cars you've never seen before, I'll tell you what an interesting thing to do is. If you want to see car, car brands you can't imagine from virtually every country, where do you think you go to see cars from all over the globe? Reykjavik, Iceland. You know, and I was there, and I was walking along the roads at a Pellerin Society meeting with my wife Maria, and I was just walking along the roads and said, have you seen that car? No. What about that car? No. Look at all these cars. Look at that. That's a Chinese car. That's a, that's a, that's a um, Swedish car I've never seen. There's a car from the Tata. There's a car from India. What's going on? Why do they have so many cars in Reykjavik that you never see in America? Because they have no auto industry. And because they have no auto industry, they have no industry who's lobbying to protect themselves from foreign cars. And so they get to enjoy the full range of 198 different automobile companies. And it's really amazing and neat. Um, so it's no surprise that uh, 25 of the 30 top used cars rated top by consumer magazines are from abroad as are eight of the top 10 new cars. This is a, one of my favorite quotes. It's almost uh, 85 years old now. It's more than 85 years old from Henry Bork Cochran, who said, the essential difference between free trade and protectionism is that under a system of free trade, the excellence of the product is the only means by which it can secure a market, while under protection, an inferior article can dominate the market through the aid of legislation. The necessary effect of free trade is, therefore, to encourage efficiency in production, while the necessary effect of protectionism is to encourage skill and corruption. How many times do we see that in American industry? Excellence of the product is the only means by which it can secure a market. You would not believe how many times I have used that line. I want the excellence of my product to be the only means by which I can secure a market. I do not have tenure. I have never had tenure. I started teaching when I got my PhD when I was 25 in 1976. Never got tenure, never asked for it, but I've been teaching my whole life and have gone from having an assistant, being an assistant professor to having a chair. 
while also at the same time being at the Fed the whole time for 25 years. What does that do to me? It forces me to have to be good every day. I hear so many complaints from students about tenured professors. Well, if I'm going to keep my job, I've got to perform. And that's exactly what um, competition does. The excellence of the product is the only means by which I choose to secure a market. Next, unions. Probably the most damaging thing to our automobile industry. Well, here is employment in the automobile industry from 1939 to 2010. And as you can see, it's a very erratic thing. I mean, this is monthly data, quarterly data, I mean. So you can see that, I mean, there are a lot of spikes up and down in this. It would be difficult to work in this industry. Got a job one day, don't the next. Why? The economy is contracting. We built the surplus of cars. People don't buy them. They're on the showroom floor. They're in the lots of the dealerships. We don't need to make any more right now. We're laid off. And they don't pay me. And then they call me back three months later. Say, we need you to work again. And then they call me, and then they fire me three months later. That is a difficult uh, work style. You got a family, you got to pay for your kids' shoes to go to school. You know, er nobody wants that kind of work life. And so it was a natural industry to be unionized and try to get the, you know, the workers some kind of contract which was m provided more stability. And so it did get unionized, and um, that's how this started here. But over time, it's gone way beyond that. The United Auto Workers Union held their picketing signs up high all day. It was at 11 a.m. on Wednesday, October 10th. Newark employees lined the entrance to the Chrysler's Parts Distribution Center along South College Avenue. The Newark plant was one of 19 Chrysler plants on strike nationwide. Leading up to the strike, UAW workers tried to negotiate a tentative agreement with the automaker for health care and security benefits of its current and retired workers. None of the Mopar service technicians could comment while on strike, but hours later UAW president said an agreement was made possible because his workers made it clear to Chrysler that they needed an agreement that rewards the contributions they have made to the success of the company. As part of the consensus, UAW is asking that Chrysler pay about $18 billion worth of retiree health care costs. Details of the agreement are being withheld, pending ratification votes by UAW Chrysler workers. For your Delaware... That Chrysler pay $18 billion, where do companies get the money from that they would spend on benefits or wages? They get it from the workers themselves who come into the company and make products and then enable the firm to then sell those products at a profit which then they can use to, to build more automobile plants, expand development and so on, pay the workers and so on. But they come from the workers themselves who have to be productive in order for the automobile industry to have anything to say grace over. How much do you think a United Auto Worker person makes with all, including all benefits, the value of their pension plan and their um, time off and so on. An average of $73.26 an hour. About $40 an hour in base pay plus night shift premiums, overtime, holidays, vacations, $33.58 in health care, pension, and other benefits and they get an automatic cost of living adjustment into their contract. Prices go up, they, their wages go up. What's more, a United Auto Workers contract with the big five, GM, Ford, Chrysler, and Delphi, and so on, says that an auto production worker is anybody who's working in that, in that environment, in that neighborhood. That includes people who are bending sheet metal, of course. It also includes people who are mowing grass and cleaning toilets. $8 an hour jobs in the real world commanding $74, $73 through the union contracts. Now, how does that leave any money for the company to survive on? This is the case where the leech gets so big it sucks all the blood out of the animal it's, it's hosting off of and even then has to move on to something else or try to revive it. And that's what's happening now. The unions are trying to revive the industry so they can go back to feasting on it. 
One forklift operator reviewed by the Detroit News at Delphi makes $103,000 a year, which if you look at um, the BLS for how much forklift operators make, Bureau of Labor Statistics, they make $26,000 on average. And it contracts guarantee that they get 12,000, that they get paid for doing nothing, 12,000 workers. If they don't need you and the production is down, just come in and watch TV, we'll still pay you. Uh, and one, here in Detroit News, they, the people were interviewing these folks and they said, we just go in and play crossword puzzles, watch videos that someone brings. Otherwise, I just sat. And I think this has come to an end, but when the United Auto Workers no longer had enough um, when the union bosses didn't have enough people working at the auto plants, they went around and tried to unionize the daycare workers in Detroit and were successful for a while. <clears throat> and um, John Stossel talks about that on his site. Where are the people? One of my favorite quotes ever. You can tell what question Mr. Ford was asked when he, answers, he answered, well, at least I don't have to deal with the robots union. Mr. Ford, why are you replacing all these people with robots? Because they don't strike, they don't moonlight, they're not complaining all the time not trying to get you know too much from me so as you, you now look at here are US motor vehicle sales by company again I showed you that who is unionized on this list GM in decline Ford in decline <coughs> Chrysler <coughs> and in decline Toyota no Honda no Nissan no Hyundai no the unions visit those <clears throat> workers, those plants regularly to try to get them to unionize. So far they have not been successful. The companies have said, look, if you unionize this plant, we'll, we'll just shut it down. And so they're expanding and they're getting paid good wages, affordable wages, so they can sustain these industries and they can sustain the jobs that go with them. Ultimately you're going to kill it if you tax it too heavily with uh, such ridiculously high wages. And finally there's liability laws in this country, and Tim made a good point of this with me when we were discussing, discussing this, and uh, very, I want to go into that because it's very interesting. A, a young couple drove a compact car into a horse that was wandering down the middle of the road. The horse's body smashed to the windshield, killing the wife. A jury ruled the vehicle wasn't crash-worthy. The woman tried to commit suicide by locking herself in the trunk of a car. She changed her mind, took her nine days before she got out. She claimed the automaker was negligent in not providing release inside the trunks. The jury agreed, gave her money, and the verdict was upheld on appeal. Teenage boys, my favorite one, took his girlfriend out for a drive in his heavily modified, jacked up 10-year-old vehicle equipped with much larger wheels than the chassis and suspension were originally designed to accommodate. It was a rainy night. He'd been drinking. He was speeding. Neither he nor his girlfriend was wearing the seat belt. The, man, the manufacturer installed seat belts. The vehicle left the road, and the girl was ejected from the vehicle, suffering permanent damage to her spine, wound up in a wheelchair. The girl decided not to sue the boy because he had no money. Instead, she went after the manufacturer. The jury found that the vehicle involved was deficient in its design, and a large cash settlement was awarded to the plaintiff. In all cases, the vehicles involved met all the requisite federal safety standards at the time of their design and manufacture. In none of these cases was it a technical malfunction uh, that was approximate cause of the accident or incident. And in all cases, yet, yet in all cases, the jury agreed, oh, I'm sorry, and in all cases, the jury agreed that the circumstances fell far outside the normal 
uh, operating range of the, of the cars or light trucks. Yet, they gave them money because, in all, the, because all these pay, cases pitted plaintiffs who'd suffered horrible personal tragedies against supposedly characterized this way as large, faceless, uncaring, deep pocket corporations, with the outcome being determined by sympathetic jurists who have simply, essentially uh, have their chance to play Santa Claus with other people's money. And the plaintiffs won, of course, and we lost. I had one of my friends at the Fed one time, a woman named Kay, uh, was sitting on a jury, and some woman got injured in something, and she was on the part of the jury, and she said, and we gave them a half a billion dollars. I said, what? We gave them a half a billion dollars. And she was like, the hero. We took this money, we gave it to her. You know, playing Santa Claus with other people's money. Well, we all lose when they do that, of course. You have this, our U.S. product liability system is unique and entirely unimitated by any of other, one other nation in the world, though they've had 25 years to observe its operation and then adopt it for themselves. Contingent fees, blue sky verdicts, punitive damages, acceptance of highly suspect expert testimony remains unique to the United States. We are the only country on the face of the globe that provides such high damages in tort cases. Other legal systems view our awards as outrageous and unconscionable. Here are some well-known product liability settlements. You've heard about this. The woman who spills coffee on herself, she was awarded uh, $2.86 million for spilling coffee on herself. But then when that went to the courts, it got knocked down to $640,000. The settlement was reduced. You've heard about that one, right? $43.7 million settlement in a motor vehicle design case. Man was killed and his wife maimed in an accident in their town car. The couple's family filed a lawsuit against Ford, claiming that the, that the uh, gas tank was in the wrong place. Never mind the fact that they were in an accident and somebody hit them or they hit somebody. It's the car's fault. The family got not, did they get 640000 No, $43.7 million. And that wasn't reduced. Here's a company. This company is in uh, Colorado, I believe. And they, you go to their website and they brag about $9.5 million settlements, $8.4 million settlements. Um, of, of, these are all auto cases, $8 million, eight, $6.5 and so on. Keep on going. We'll get you a whole bunch of money. And this company alone, from what I can tell, just look, look at the cases listed on the website, has awarded $100 million to a relative handful of victims for uh, automobile accidents. Here are the number of product, here are the number of motor vehicle product liability lawsuits from 2000 to 2009, that 10 year period. There were 5,216 motor vehicle pro product liability lawsuits during this 10 year period. Had the average suit netted the plaintiff just a million dollars, the U.S. auto industry would have shelled out $5.2 billion if it settled these claims and, and if it gave them the money. And that's worth far more than the market value of the companies. So the claims that we're getting against these companies every year are far in excess of, work, of the value of the companies. That's how crazy this, we, we've let this become with our product liability laws. So I was reading this article on American Civil Justice Dilemma, the Case for Reform, when I noticed that there are 70,000 product liability suits pending annually in the United States, compared with only 200 in the United Kingdom. 70,000 there, here, 200 there. Clearly, our, the, our, the setup of our rules and our laws lean into inviting suits against American companies for doing anything which the customer can, can even plausibly in any sense claim that something went wrong with the product and then they, they deserve some money. So I checked on that in fact and that's actually true. So what's happened? That's what's happened. Taxes, unions, regulation, protectionism and our crazy liability law that's why the industry is dying, and it's, and it's not going, it can't, doesn't really have a hope of recovering until we change those things, and we're not yet. That's uh, the stuff behind Detroit disassembled, and if you see this city, and this was the most glorious city in America at one time. It was the 
uh, it was a shining example of how America can succeed by being hardworking, industrious, innovative, um, ahead of the, so far ahead of the rest of the world. But we went so far wrong to today, uh, it's, it's completely turned to where factories now look like this, abandoned, houses all over Detroit. Population of Detroit has shrunk from Detroit proper, the city, from at one time almost 2 million people, 1.85 million, now down to less, a million less, a million fewer people. Opera House falling down, theater the same, schools abandoned, as they don't need them because the pop people have moved on. Uh, these are the five forces destroying Detroit, but honestly, more generally, they're five forces capable of destroying anything they come uh, into all of American industry. Thank you. We have time for q and I, I believe, right? What would you have me do, Tim? Okay, and feel, feel free to ask questions in any areas. I mean, I've got a pretty broad um, set of uh, things that I work on here. Didn't give you much time to think, but let me do that. So, who would like to start with the, with the queue? Yes, sir. Compared to, sorry. <laughs> Compared to 2008, do you see the automotive industry on a rise, a steady rise, or do you see it rising then falling shortly after? The latter. It's on a rise, but I believe it's a temporary rise. I don't think it can be sustained. Uh, we're yet to really feel the competition from China. Uh, China, you know, if you look at the way Japan made cars, at first Japan made inexpensive cars, right? The Cor Toyota Corolla, the Corona. And then they took that money and wisely reinvested in their industry to make the good cars like Lexuses and so on that Americans like to drive. Uh, China will start, it looks like it's going to start on the same path from the cars are making. It's a pretty good car at first. By the way, Hyundai did the same thing. But China's make, making a pretty good car at first that most Americans wouldn't be interested in. But as they, and so we're, and so we're not buying them and they're not even available here. But as they get better, you're going to see uh, a plethora of Chinese cars in this country and Indian cars as well. And so I think, you know, the competition is going to be very strong and Detroit's just not been used to that. So, you know, Detroit's making a, a little bit of a revival now. The, in, the, the way I see it is the unions are trying to show, hey, if you just turned the industry up over us all, all along, we, we could have really make it done, do well. But the incentives aren't right um, in, in a union-based company to, to sustain uh, productivity for a long time. How many here, of you here have seen um, the, the first third of Atlas Shrugged, which came out recently? Is that, has Atlas Shrugged been available up here? You've got to see Atlas Shrugged if you hadn't read the book. Because um, the movie, movie is, a, you know, your generation doesn't do as much reading as mine. That's a real shame. I don't know how you sustain um, your deep knowledge of things without reading. So at least go see the movie. But in the movie, Atlas Shrugged, they come up to the point where, um, they come to a firm that's, I believe it's an automobile firm that had a uh, super good motor, efficient motor of some sort. And then the, the industry's just shut down. Everything's left in ruins. And, and you wonder what happened here. And they say, what happened here? Well, the unions came in, and they decided to equalize wages. So everybody who was ambitious and productive left, and everybody who wasn't, and wasn't worth that much to begin with, the average wage stayed, and the whole thing just died. So any structure of wages where I'm going to pay you the same regardless of how well you do, how much you work, is a structure that's doomed to create failure. So it can't, unless they change that, take, take us anywhere upward for very long, in my opinion. Watch and see. How does it happen? And by the way, that structure of wages is the structure of wages in American education, in American public schools. 
That's one of the main things killing American public schools is the union wage structure. Where really good teachers don't get paid more for being good, really bad teachers who even take in and do inappropriate things with their students, almost impossible to get them fired. So, next question. Yes, sir. This gentleman heard me on the radio this morning. Yeah, I really don't belong Pleasure. here, I suppose. But the, I, well, I'm glad you um, do. Germany, Germany, France, and even Japan have unions. Can you describe the difference in how they function from the unions in the United States? Well, they States? don't function. I, I don't know the differences that well, but I know that they don't function even well there. And that's kind of what's wrong with America. We're becoming, through unions and other things, we're in some kind of like democratic, we're becoming a little like democratic socialist nations. We're, we're, come, we're going toward um, Europe in terms of what's happening to our nation. And, and I'm, let me talk not just with our unions, but like I said, with our, with our socialist democratic state. And this last uh, election, the president, the guy who's now president, ran, on the, ran openly on the platform of income redistribution. First election I've ever seen where we just brashly and boldly say, you know, I think we need to redistribute income in this America. And guess what? He got the majority of the votes. Does that surprise anybody? <coughs> Let's, let me put a divide, a divide the room roughly in half and leave 51 people over there and 50 people over here. And I'm just going to suppose these are the 50 people who make the most money and you're the 51 who make the least. What's the dominant political platform? One of you just needs to say, hey, I'm going to run for office. And my platform is going to be, I'm going to redistribute income from this side to that side. You know, in any group of 11 people, six can vote to take the money from the other five. And so uh, what we don't allow people to do with guns, we now let them to do with, with the majority rule. And so you can get socialism out of democracy. There are plenty of states in the world, South America. Venezuela is a socialist democratic state. And m much of uh, Europe is, and America has been heading that way because now the bottom 60% of all income taxpayers in this country pay a grand total of 1% of all income taxes, and the top 1% pay 40. It's what my friend, my favorite, econ my, my favorite economist is Walter Williams. You probably know him. As, he was trained by uh, Thomas Sowell. He was trained by Milton Friedman. Both Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell happen to be black, but they're also probably, the, I think, one of the best economists have ever lived. Walter Williams has a column he writes syndicated for the newspaper, and I was watching Walter in... Um, talk in, in Washington one day when Walt, somebody asked, Dr. Williams, um, I now pay 40% of all my income to the, to the government in the form of taxes. What is that? What do you think about that? And Dr. Williams said, well, let me ask you this. Let's suppose you got up and worked every day, all day long, for the whole week, and at the end of the week, nothing that you produced belonged to you. It all owned, belonged to and was get, had to be turned over to your master. What would you call that? And of course, everybody knew. Oh, it's slavery. Okay. He said, what would you call it if you get up every day and you work all day long, seven days a week, and at the end of the day, end of the week, 40% of everything you produce goes to the government. Nothing you can do about it. And people said, I don't know. What's, what's the name for that? He said, look, it's 40% slavery. And I thought, uh, yes. We do have slavery in America now. We have the tyranny of the majority, where the, minority can, the majority can now vote themselves, through democracy, rights over other people's lives and, and their income, and, and whether these other people have to get to enjoy the fruits of their own labor. That's 40% slavery. And we're headed that way, it's for sure. And there's a big, that's what the Tea Party movement's about. There's a big reaction against it right now. And I hope it's successful because we've, America is um, close to the tipping point. Yes, ma'am. Yes, lady. Some, give me, a, give me some questions. I'm not letting you out of here. Yes, sir. With the um, the tragedy in Japan with Toyota, Acura, and Honda. For the summer, I know there's a big, uh, not a avail big availability on parts. Do you see the those three import companies 
like a major like slowdown for the summer and the domestics like going to rise for the summer? I don't think so. Well, certainly wouldn't be major. I mean, they're going to they're going to scramble as fast as they can to get those parts made somewhere. And uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll know that just, you know, you, you know, when you know capitalism, you know that that's going to happen, that they're going to be turning their attention to getting the parts. There may be a little slowdown. The American economy is slowing down again. And so um, the, in the, when the durable, you know, th there's a relationship between the business cycle and the consumption of durable goods. If the economy goes like, like this, the durables industry goes like this. And durables are things that last a while, like automobiles, appliances, refrigerator, even clothing. And the durable goods industry picks back up when the economy is picking back up, but then it slows back down quickly when the economy slows down. Since the economy's growth, since the economy's growth rate is kind of slowed, <coughs> I think you're going to have a lot of um, lost sales by these companies. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's you. It's, oh, you got to go ahead. And this fellow over here has a question. Brian, right? Okay. Sorry about that. I'll make this quick. Um, where do you see really the big three in, uh, in eight to ten years, basically? Do you think eventually that the competition will just kind of overtake them? I mean, they have some, I mean, like you said, they have some really nice products coming out. But, you know, do you think that will be enough to sustain uh, any more progress up to like 13 million annual sales for domestics? Or where do you see them, in our big three, in uh, eight to ten years? Well, you saw that BMW automobile. You saw the level of technology that's in that automobile. So they're going to continue to provide a lot of competition to the U.S. auto industry. Um, I'm not going to buy a Detroit product for quite a while. Um, and uh, either they have to get much better. Um, I mean, if, you, if I go down the road and I see cars that are falling apart and the paint's worn off and, you know, you can see through the paint and it wasn't good enough to sustain 10 years, well, more, more often than not, that car is a U.S. car. It just doesn't maintain itself over time. So I've got this image in my mind. Like the Cadillac decided to kind of like sell out and make a lot of those little Cadillac Cimarrons, which were just started just falling apart. Um, the image I have in my mind, I think a lot of Americans do now, of American cars is going to take years to change. And what they're going to have to do is make a good car for a long time before I begin to believe that they're the leaders of the pack. Meanwhile, though, like I said, Germany and all these other companies are going to be in there making the top-of-the-line cars. And then coming from the bottom, you've got the, the Chinese and you've got the, the Indians and so on and the Hyundai. And uh, Let me show you one more graph right here. Let's see. Why does this thing not move? Okay, that's good. It's locked up. I'm going to show you, Graph, about the, the up, up and coming cars. Let me get this. I'll have to open this back up. I'm not responding. Don't you hate that? And I'm switching to a Mac, too. This is another thing that drives me nuts at my, this, the, that uh, this PCs are uns. Sorry? Yes, it is. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not mind telling you it's my computer, uh, but uh, I don't like it happening. Okay, so uh, what I was going to say is there's an awful lot of competition coming from many new automobile companies out there, and uh, I just don't I just don't see how America all of a sudden repairs itself with the automobile industry being partly run by government, partly run by and then run by unions, not just as laborers, but as managers of the company, and then having all these product liability, all these other problems. I mean, you just don't, you don't recover. You have to have a sea change in government before you're really going to have any changes in, in our, our industry. And it's not just that industry. It's more. This thing's locking up on me. Sorry. I can't believe this happened in the middle of a presentation. I'll work on it while I answer the question. You had a question. This yeah. fellow over here. Well, I'll tell you one of the most, what can U.S. business owners do about unions? One of the most um, 
effective things for controlling unions, and it's happening right now, is mobility across American states, people moving. Inside our borders now, America, there is a monumental migration going on. More people moved inside America from state to state over the past four years than any other time in American history. 30 million people moved. So that's a giant amount of movement across the country. Why did they move? I've done just recently completed a study to figure out why are Americans moving. And I tried a bunch of different things to see, OK, what are people moving for? Are they moving to states where the unemployment rates are lower? Are they moving to get away from crime? Are they moving for this, that, or the other? And I was able to identify six variables which were statistically significant as causing mobility across America. And the number one variable was the margin, the high, was the state income tax rate. It's th that variable tied, was tied with another variable for being the most quantitatively and qualitatively significant in driving migration across America. People are moving from states where the income tax rate is high, the personal income tax rate is high, and they're moving to states where the personal income tax rate is low. There are seven states in this country with no personal income tax rate. Income tax rates in addition to the federal rate. Texas is one of those. Florida is one, and there are five others. Um, I don't want to install software right now. But the, the personal income tax rate in the highest marginal rate in California, example, for example, is 10.6%. It's 12 percent in states in the north, many of the states in the northeast. So people are moving out of those high tax states. If you if you make about sixty thousand dollars a year, and you live in New York, your monthly taxes, income taxes, are about equal to the car payment on a BMW. So it's like move to Texas and get a free BMW. When people and then the second the variable that's the next most significant in driving migration across America is the percentage of the state's private sector labor force that's unionized. People are leaving states where unions have a big force and presence, and they're moving to states where there's not a big union force or presence. Um, there's about 27.5% of the labor force in New York in the private sector that's unionized. In Texas, it's 6.4%. So, it's a big difference, and people are moving for that. Now, it's not, yes, in some cases, it's the individual getting up and moving, deciding, hey, I'm going to quit working in this state, and I'm going to go somewhere else. But in many cases, it's the corporation moving the workers, so that the people who own the corporation and make good money, who are paying these high income tax rates, want to move to another state where they don't pay high income tax rates. And the people are happy to go because they'll be relieved of the state income tax burden. And there are also states trying to get away from unions because in states where there are unions, the workers just don't, you know, have their bad attitude. Their attitude is bad, and they don't work. When they move to these other states, their attitude is better. And then, so then that disciplines the state which people are leaving to behave, supposedly. Notice what's been going on in Wisconsin, right? Well, there's a huge flood of people out of Wisconsin. And, and because of that flood, uh, now there's some discipline back, back on Wisconsin to behave. Michigan is losing a tremendous number of people. Third highest, third, third, third highest ranked state in terms of, the num in terms of um, people leaving that state, I believe, are Michigan. I'm going to show you that right now. New, number one is California in terms of people leaving a state. Number two is um, New York. And number three, I believe, is Michigan. Let me just show you that. So that's a force. That's one of the best forces for disciplining um, government policies is what's called, what a friend of mine uh, at, some, at the Public Choice Center when I was at Virginia Tech started this whole st stuff called voting with your feet. It's what's called the Tebow hypothesis where people uh, are voting with their feet by just leaving an area that they don't like. Here are the biggest net gainers in America. In terms of in migration over the four year period, the last four year period for which we have data, 04 to 08, red is if they came from abroad, blue is if they came from other states, and then black is the sum of the two. Texas, Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, 
Arizona gained the most people, and here's where they came from. California, New York, Michigan, New Jersey, Illinois, Louisiana, it's a fluke, that's Katrina. Back to, back to Ohio and Massachusetts, see? Coming from the Northeast and coming from California and in the Northeast, like New York, that people are treated as infinitely taxable resources. Labor unions are belligerent. And so said, so, you know, we're just going to move this company. This is crazy. That's a strongly, strong disciplining force. Yes, sir. Stop what? Oh, yes. Right. That is the most destructive thing I have heard coming out of the federal level in a long time. Did you, the gentleman said was that the National Labor Relations Board is trying to stop Boeing from moving from a state in which they no longer want to be in Washington to uh, Georgia, South Carolina. Of course, the company wants to move. They want to move for exactly the reasons I said, but it's their own, it, it should, it is, it has been, and should be, of course, their prerogative to locate any case, any place they want to. But they don't want them to move. National labor, the labor doesn't want them to move. Why? Because they're moving out of a unionized state into a lo less unionized one. So the whole idea of there being a federal lawsuit against that to me is, is you see, we don't have a strong enough constitution in this country to, present, to prevent us from decisions like that being made. That should be a matter of constitution. There, there should be right to work in all states. Um, the states, let me show you the unionization rates across states. I think this may be going to freeze again. It's acting like it's going to freeze again. Okay, so here you go. Here are the unionization rates in the private sector across all the states. So 27.5% of the labor force in New York that's in the private sector is unionized in another state, 6.2. We've got, uh, where is Washington on here? Right there. A union type state, South Carolina, the, less, the least unionized. So it's exactly what you'd predict. We want to move the plant to get away from these, this crazy union stuff. But at the federal level, they're trying to stop it. If they are successful in doing that, and if it gets, and I think, of course, if they think if they were successful, then it would be appealed to the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court supports it, which I don't think they would, then we've got a whole new ball game in this country, and it's game over. For unions, are, unions are trying to take control. Uh, you do not have the right to work in these states in blue without joining a union. I want to hire you, you want to work for me. That's enough. Some third party says, no, you can't do that. You've got to join a union. Why does the third party do that? Because the union wants a certain percent of his wages. The union, at the, the bosses at the top do. Unions benefit a very, very, very small handful of people, the union bosses at the top. Everybody else, including particularly the workers, are hurt because they eventually lose their job when the, when the company that they're unionizing collapses or they move. So don't fool yourself. Unions exist for the very small handful of belligerent union bosses at the top who will, who will do almost anything to maintain their, the, the position that they get of wealth and so on through the virtual extortion. It, this, this should have been a matter of law years ago that, hey, you want to work for me and I want to hire you, that's, that's it. You have the right to work. But for votes, for votes, we have now uh, given the union way too much power in return for having, now they don't have right to work anymore in return for it and having union shops. They vote, they vote a certain way. So it's a bad political deal. There's a real bad nexus between economics and politics in this country. Without it, that's what you get when you don't have a strong enough constitution. Yes, ma'am.
it's, it's been on the decline. It has been on the decline for years, uh, but unions are still fighting back, fighting back, fighting back. Uh, the union membership in this country reached a peak in about 1953 when the largest percentage ever of Americans worked for unions, and I think it was about 30 percent. That's because we were mainly in the manufacturing environment, and uh, unions uh, had a, a, a big presence in that environment. And also, now there, uh, there was, and, and now it's about 10 and a half, 11 percent, fraction of the labor force that unionized. But unions aren't sitting back and just letting this happen. They're very strategically going into the sectors of the economy, like education. And the biggest union uh, sector there is now, biggest union presence there is now, is in the teachers, the teachers union. Something like six and a half million teachers unionized. And um, they always go to where there's, you know, they can extract the most rent. I mean, when the industrial age, what was the most valuable thing? Machinery and equipment in the factories. Well, that's what the labor is. Let's unionize that because there's going to be the most excess profits there for us to kind of extract. Or I should say excess profits, but just profits there for extract. Now they go into the, to the schools and because our, we have to build intellectual capital and not so much physical capital, let's tax that sector and get every, everything out of it we can. So I, don't, I think that, that they have been on the decline, but they're certainly fighting back. As I mentioned, they came in around Detroit here. After, they, after the number of union workers in the automobile industry went on decline, they said, well, gosh, our dues are going down. We've got we to gotta get some more union workers. So they went to the state government and had the state government declare uh, daycare center workers as public employees and instantly unionized them and started, and they, and started taking their money and do. So you just all of a sudden one day you wake up and the union's got your daycare worker and they redefined you as public sector worker and you're paying some of your money to the, to the, to the union bosses. That's a bad nexus of corrupt politicians and, uh, and labor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. May I? Okay. I'll just step away from the speaker. Um, I've got a question about um, regulation. You've spoken about regulation, but I'm, I'm not interested in financial regulation or, or this new age where we um, fuel consumption. I'm talking about safety regulation in particular when pertaining to cars. Now, why is it that if a good company would themselves make, we would assume, a quality car and sell it to the public, a safe car? Yeah. And um, a company that's not so good would do the opposite. Why is it that a regulation from the government in that sense would prevent anyone from doing a quality job because a quality company would have a self-imposed regulation, right? Yes. Those same scientists would have to follow yeah. certain procedures to make a safe car even without the government. Well, there's, there's many, many uh, angles to that. First of all, sometimes when the government imposes safety regulations and mandates them by a certain time, that's not enough time to really implement that safety regulation safely, such as in the case of airbags. The government said, look, you've got to have airbags in your car within three years. Nothing the industry could do except make them as quick as they could. They did, and they exploded on a lot of kids. And so what the industry would have done without that government regulation is introduce them over a more safe time period. More, uh, they would have worked out the bugs better. People, you know, as, as a, a company who makes cars doesn't have an incentive to make a car which hurts the people who drive it because if information travels, I mean, Volvo, automatically right now we have some cars, like people, what do they think of the Volvo? They think of the Volvo as a safe car. So for those of you who have to, whose safety is your primary concern, you can go get a Volvo. Safety is not my primary concern. If it were, I'd drive a tank. I want speed. I've got a BMW 545i. I want performance. I want looks. I want comfort, I want a good stereo system, and I wouldn't trade all that for a little bit more safety. The people vary in terms of how much they want safety. And by the way, cars have become safer over time in, in numbers that you can't possibly believe. <coughs> uh, we, we, um, automobile accidents, relative, automobile deaths relative to the number of miles driven have declined by 90% since 1950. Okay, it's declined by 99% actually in the in the airline industry. 99.9% .9 fewer deaths per per billion miles driven. 
So the automobile industries are, will, would have an incentive on their own to do things to make the car safer, but not too safe. Nothing is totally safe. People fall down the stairs every day. Uh, about 1,000 people die every year of falling down the stairs. About 1,000 people die every year of choking on food. You'll never make everything totally safe. And, and uh, same thing's true with nuclear power. You'll never make it totally safe. Nothing is going to be totally safe. And the cost of trying to make it perfectly safe gets in infinite. And so there's just, you know, I, we, we have to make it, every, everything is an economic decision. How much safe do you want at this price, considering you want all these other things too? And so I, I just, you know, I think it, for the government to come tell us how much safety we're going to have is misplaced. It's the consumer's decision about how safe they, they should choose to be. And some cars can be safer than others. That little bitty car you get on the road right now that's about this big, electric car that you're coming out with, how safe do you think that little electric car is? And you hit that car, you're dead. Yet, they're going to worship that car. Why? Because it's green. So they're willing to sacrifice all levels of safety for that little car because it's going to save three miles a gallon or something for... But they're not willing to do it for, you know, a Hummer. So I, I, I just think it's, uh, again, it's, it's them trying to legislate every aspect of choice for individuals. Uh, so I just don't want the government in my life that much. and I'm not willing to uh, give up on that. Anybody else? Mike, when you look at the automobile industry today and you think about the fact that union membership is down, productivity is, is up substantially for the big three, and then you take a look at some manufacturing success stories like Lincoln Electric out of Cleveland near bankruptcy, and today they're the, at least one of the world-class producers of uh, arc welders. Same thing happened with Anderson Window and they've uh, dramatically changed their labor agreements, a lot of profit sharing and incentives for the, for the workers. And you think about the, the big three and, and the comeback that one of the students asked you about, and you were obviously pessimistic about the big three over the long term. Is it that you don't think that the American worker can be incentivized and can rise to the occasion and be a world-class manufacturer? Add Dow Chemical. Mm -hmm. uh, to that equation yeah. here in Michigan, world-class manufacturer in the state of Michigan. Is your pessimism based on the workers or is it more based on the regulations and the tax structure and you see that that's not going to move as quickly uh, to allow the American manufacturers well, to compete? My pessimism is never based on the people. I mean, I was in the Soviet Union in 1991, expected to find, from what I was told, from the propaganda, from media and government before I went there, and expected to find a bunch of people who were, you know, evil and hated government, hated America and Americans. No, I didn't find it at all. I found really good people and a really, really bad system who had over the years had that system so long that they just couldn't quite function any longer. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about your question really last night. It's not the people. Think about this, and you're going to experience it this, and I'm talking to them now, Tim, in your lifetime. You will not grow as a worker, as a producer, as a person, apart from hard times. You know, where, there's, where there's always rain, uh, excuse me, it takes a little rain to make the flowers grow. Where there's always sunshine, there's a desert below. Skills, smooth seas never made skilled sailors. Little is learned apart from suffering. The times of my life when I've probably grown the most are the times that I've had to, to pull back and think about, gee, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make it? I'm, not, I'm out there on my own. I'm not protected. I'm going to have sleepless nights, lots of worrying, lots of trying to figure out what my next move is, competing in this world, dog-eat-dog, dog, it's a jungle out there. Don't even wake up in the morning, know that you're going to have a job the next day. What do you do in that environment? You get really tough and really strong. And, it, and if we spare people that, the pain and the suffering and the sleepless nights and all the thinking and all the, the you know, just 
all that pain, you really rob them of their soul and their chance to be great and to respond to it and rise to it and to go beyond it and get strong on the inside. Some of the strongest people I know, many of the strongest people I know in this country, my wife's an example of this. They were born very poor, went through hardship, and now they get this tremendous substance about them, constitution. They're fearless. They, my wife was born in Ecuador. She came to America when she was 12, totally poor. Her parents had to throw newspapers, clean houses, in order to, and do everything in order to survive. The kids were put to work, um, and uh, they had no furniture. They slept on the floor, even left, lived in a car for a while. Uh, now she has an MBA from Yale and has a business with five stores and several employees and a uh, very strong individual, but it came from the hardship. She's got a constitution. So if we allow people to go through that, they're as resilient and tough as they have to be. I, you know, there are two people inside me. I know them both. One of them, if the incentives are there, will get up early in the morning and work and respond to it and just be a humming producer day after day after day. The other one is I'm going to call my cousin Ed, who who's I used to play around, play with in Brandon, Mississippi, who is satisfied to have a couch and a satellite dish and a beer and uh, sits around at the volunteer fire department telling jokes all day long. He retired from the highway department when he was 43 and uh, just wants to kick back and enjoy life. I could be Ed so easy. Why don't I? I'm, I'm the incentives are right for me not to. I think if we put the incentives back with the people in the automobile industry, they would, could, would and could perform marvelously, and they could make the best car. It, that's the paradox of this system of unions and protectionism. It just, it just destroys their soul and their, and their being, and they're the ones who are hurt the most by it. So do I think they could? Yes. But do I think we're going to be able to pry, pry the labor unions out of this mess? No, I don't. I know. So I think it is going to be, I think the people could rise to be great. I don't know if they will, but it, all these other things are still hurting. You know, taxes. I think we're going to lower the corporate tax rate. We have to. We're under a lot of pressure to lower the corporate tax rate. Uh, product liability. That's, we're getting tort reform across the states. I don't know if the tort reform is going to uh, apply to products like that, but we are getting tort reform across across the United States in many states. That'll help a lot, especially in the medical industry. Uh, I don't know, Tim. I, I am kind of pessimistic about this industry, quite frankly, because I just think that labor unions have got it kind of bollocked up, and they're not going to let people come back in. What I saw in the Soviet Union after th that system being in the economy for 70-something years is that I saw old people in their 70s and 80s who could not, literally could not go, go back to a system of capitalism and competition. They didn't know how to do it. it, was, it was just They had no, no institutional memory of how to go out and actually start marketing a product to a person and trying to sell them something and shagging products every day long and thinking about stuff they'd been taken care of for so long by the state that they were just basically elderly children. So I mean, if the longer we go down this path of dependency, the more we get ourselves in, in, into a permanent state of it. And it's the rise and fall of nations. I mean, let me show you one more graph here. If I have it, I'll show you. Um, it's called the fatal sequence. I talked about this on the radio this morning. This was something that was documented by Alexander Fraser Teitler, who was a Scottish historian, author, econo e economist, and lawyer and all this back in the late 18, 1789. He wrote about the Teitlers, something later uh, that was called the Teitler cycle or the fatal sequence, and it begins with bondage. People are in bondage. From that, they develop some kind of faith, spiritual faith, which leads to the courage to do something about it, have a revolution. I saw this in the Soviet Union. The courage leads to liberty. liberty. Liberty leads to free markets, abundance, and things are working great. But then with abundance and years of abundance, people forget about stuff, where stuff comes from, think it's always going to be there for them. And that leads to complacency. Complacency leads to apathy. I saw this in Japan. It's funny. We talked, Japan went through these cycles. And Japan, you know, 
we stuck capitalism in Japan, and then they got up from underneath their emperorship and, uh, and imperial, imperial nation stuff, and we uh, had this, they had this period of abundance from factories working hard. The older people were working hard. They were saving 40% of their income. But the kids of the second generations later, when I was in Tokyo a couple of years ago, I encountered a set of kids called NEETS, N-E-E-T, which stands for, one of my friends there, Yoshinori Shimitsu, said, hey, have you seen the NEETS? So what are you talking about? Go, go down to the you know, place where the kids hang out, and you'll see young kids going around, boyfriend and girlfriend, just hanging around all day long. They just play all day long. They're young adults who will never have a job. They're not employed or in education or training. Their parents were wealthy industrialists. They've got enough money to live off their life. And that generation of people has moved to, you know, they don't know where stuff comes from. Their parents did. Complacency, apathy. Apathy leads to dependence on the state to take care of you with entitlements, and then you're back in bondage. China is right here, gone from liberty, coming out of feudalism and communism into abundance. India is in here. Cuba's right there, North Korea, Venezuela is right there. When I was in the Soviet Union, they were right here. They were worshiping in their homes and getting together the courage to break out of it. The United States is in here somewhere. Europe is right there. Romans, the Greeks. This was, there were paintings on this by Thomas Cole. They're fantastic. You should look at the paintings. It's a sequence of uh, the, uh, oh, shoot. Just look up the Thomas Cole paintings on, uh, one of them is called the, uh, the Consummation. If you'll see that one, you'll see the rest. They'll have the rest of them there, too. We've observed this happen to nations. And unfortunately, it can happen to America. You get to it, and it is, and you get to kind of a tipping point somewhere in here, and you, you can't go back. And I'll say one more thing about this, and I'll let you go here, is that this is why I think immigration is so important to America, the right kind of immigration. If you get the right kind of, if Im our immigration laws are set up right, you get the kind of people who came to America, you know, the, who, for the Statue of Liberty kind of thing, right? I'm coming here, uh, give me your tired, your hungry, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. I'm coming to work. <coughs> I believe in myself and self-determination. I'm strong. Uh, just give me a chance to prove it. I'll start a company. I'll work any amount it takes to get ahead. I'll lift myself up my own bootstraps. And these people come in here, and, they're, and they've left bondage. They might have left their country where they were very poor. Things weren't working well. They come here, and, and they feed this part of the good cycle. And this is another thing wrong with America right now is our immigration policy is cutting back on immigration, and particularly of those kinds of people. So it's not... We're, we're, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a pessimist, but I don't like the way things are going right now in America. Things to think about. All right. Thank you.